We've been in a series called Forge since about 2012. <laughs> and uh, we've talked through Abraham and David, how God forged them through the highs and the lows of their lives, through the mistakes, through the victories. And when we submit our hearts to the Lord, God uses every aspect of our life and forges us into a great tool and a great weapon and a great servant. And we are, we've, last week we talked about Absalom, the, the, the making of Absalom. And Absalom is one who did not submit his life to the Lord, did not submit his heart to the Lord. And what ended up happening in his life is Absalom became more and more arrogant, more and more self uh, fulfilling and his life was in, ends in destruction. We're going to see that today. So today, uh, last week we talked about forged by wounds. Today we're going to talk about forged by pride. And we go, ouch. The first service was very, very quiet while I was preaching. They were very quiet. How many of you have a little bit of pride? I don't mean pride like warriors, go warriors. I don't mean that kind of pride. I mean just that little bit. Of, I was on the back road. Uh, how many of you know that little back road, Highland? It goes, rips around. You can rip it all the way around to North Livermore. How many, how many know that road? So I, I drive a Mustang. Slowly. Slowly. I love that back road. I prefer it. I get in my car. I, I throw it into sport mode. And I don't go fast. I just, a little bit, not a lot. And I, and I, and I like that back road. It's really fun. Well, I was going down that road the other day. And right as you come in, they were doing some construction, so they had some stuff set up, and I had to stop, and there was a little girl that came racing up behind me, almost rear-ended me. I looked in my mirror, and she, you know, she had a little, I, I really believe it was a battery-operated car. It was some kind of a, it was, it was some form of battery-operated vehicle. And I was like, okay, lady, just, you know, this is a dangerous road. I pull out after they let us go through, and I'm up to about 45 miles an hour, and here comes... Mrs. Doubtfire, I, that's what I called her. She comes ripping on a blind corner about 70 miles an hour in her little battery-operated vehicle. And she got in front of me. And I was like, all right, man, she almost killed me. I was like, what are you doing? You're crazy, you're psycho. On the back of her thing, it said, there was a big old sticker that said, give peace a chance. <laughs> you're not peaceful. What are you doing? And so we, we're driving along, and I see her just terrorizing the place. I mean, she's just going nuts. And all of a sudden, you know those big hay trucks out there or something like that? is right in front of her, and she has to stop. And I kind of get up behind her, and she's going right, and I'm going this way. And I literally, when she turned, we, saw, we locked eyes for a moment. And I literally did this, ah! <laughs> because the truck turned with her. And I, I just, I, I was, this is what I did, yeah! And then we dro I drove off in just so much joy. And I felt like the Lord said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? That's a little, is that just a little bit of pride? Because wouldn't, shouldn't I have just gone like this? Oh, go, go ahead, ma'am. You, you're obviously in a hurry and not smart. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> just Pride. And some, some little bit of pride, you don't really see it, doesn't really do much, but there's other choices we make out of pride that destroy lives. Absalom walked in pride. His father wounds, he didn't let the Lord heal him, and they festered and turned into pride. Self-seeking lifestyle. I'm going to get it, and I'm going to get it my way. So let's go to 2 Samuel 15, 1. After this, it happened that Absalom provided for himself. You might want to underline provided for himself chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So he's getting ready to take over his father's kingdom. David is king. He wants to take the kingdom from him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside uh, uh, to the gate. So it was whenever anyone would come out of a lawsuit to come to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. And Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I... We're made judge in the land. And everyone who has any, any suit or cause would come to me and I would give them justice. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him that he would put out his hand, take him and kiss him. And in, the man, in this manner, uh, Absalom acted toward all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. Right? Underline this. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. It's a big thing. Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vows. And so he's, he's really duping his father. He goes, I want to go, go worship the Lord. And he's basically setting up a coup 
to take over his father's kingdom. Uh, go to verse uh, 10. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, and you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men uh, uh, who were invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. By the way, there's a whole lot of eyes going on in here. I will. Write that down. I will is a problem. You go to the grocery store, I've said this before, there's magazine racks, and it's all about I, self, us, be better looking, lose weight, get a tan. It's all be amazing. We got the iPhone, the iPad, the I this, the I this, the me that, the me this. Anybody in here a me monster? I'm a little bit of a me monster. It's all about me, Jesus. Remember that old worship song, it's all about you? Jesus. Sometimes it's all about me. And what happens is when I get into a situation where the Lord's trying to make me a servant, that me monster gets confronted by the Lord. It's not all about you. You think it's all about you, but it's not all about you. It's about me and you submitting to me. So Absalom is literally in this position where he's going, I will, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I saw something in scripture and I've read this story tons of times. And I've saw, I've, there's two things I saw today, uh, this week in Scripture that I never, I've never seen before. It blew my mind. We're going to parallel today Absalom and Satan and David and Jesus. We're going to look at the, how these two parallel. Look what happens in Isaiah 14, 12, talking about Satan when he was in heaven. Before he got kicked out of heaven, what happened? Isaiah 14, 12 says this. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, listen to this, this is huge. I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend or ab above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high God. The devil had two problems. One, he had pride. Two, he wanted what God, what God had. He wanted to sit where God was. He wanted to receive worship because God was receiving worship. He was a created being, and he said, I'm going to do this. I will rise. I will. I will. And, the, and Jesus said this in the New Testament about the devil. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, he got spiked because the creation was not greater than the creator. And he said, I want, I want what you're going to give me. I, I want that spot. I want to sit in the throne and I want to be worshiped by others. How many of you know that wasn't the will of God? And God said, and kicked him out of heaven. Absalom, same thing. I'm, watch this. I want to be in the seat that you're sitting in. I want to take care of this place. I want to be king. Now, he was next in line to be king or maybe, maybe two away from being king. And even, even if he had never become king, what if God's promise for him and plan for him was that he wasn't ever to be king, but he was going to be a great son of the king that did great things in the land? Father of peace is what his name was supposed to, is, was supposed to mean, yeah? Pride's a very dangerous thing. Pride is very deceptive. How many know pride sometimes uh, doesn't feel like pride? It looks like wisdom from your perspective. Well, I got this figured out. The Bible says this, that, that Absalom came and he took the hearts of the people. He stole them. And I wrote this down. You should write it down too. Absalom didn't trust, he took. He didn't trust God, he took. You know when the Bible says don't commit adultery, Ten Commandments, don't do what? Don't go after your neighbors. Why? Why didn't God just say don't commit adultery, with that woman. Why did he tie the husband in that same verse? Because she doesn't belong to you. Wow. The oxygen just got sucked out of the room. Adultery is pure and simple selfish pride. That person does not belong to you. You don't have the right to touch them. I remember when I was a youth pastor and kids would be dating and, and I would say, hey, how you guys doing uh, with your dating? They're 15. Yeah, and, and I'd say to the guy, hey, are you touching her? What do you mean? Am I you know what I mean. What do you, what do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> are you playing tonsil hockey with her? 
That's terrible. I'm sorry. It's junior high pastor day came back right there. Just remember that somebody's wife you're kissing. He goes, what do you mean? I, go, I highly doubt you're going to marry her, but somebody will someday. That's not your property, dude. Until there's a ring on it, you don't own that. That's not yours. By the way, we don't own. I want to make sure. And that, that's going to be on YouTube, right? <laughs> 70 million views later. It's interesting that we always want what we perceive is ours. Absalom saw David's kingdom and some people look at other people's prosperity as belonging to them. Me too. Me too. I should be having that. So Absalom didn't trust. He took. Listen, he provided for himself. The The verse opens up with he provided for himself. And anytime we provide for ourselves a strategy that doesn't have God involved in it, it's going to end in trouble. Amen? Amen. It's going to, you oh man, I'm going to get that girl, I'm going to get that guy, I'm going to get that job, I'm going to get that promotion. I'm going to, you ever been around people in your job, you just, you just feel like they're constantly undermining and working so that they can look better and you look worse because they want the job? Yeah? Isn't that hard? The Bible says this, rejoice with those who rejoice. So next time somebody gets a promotion at your job that you feel like belongs to you, this is what you should do. You should just walk up to those people and be like, hey, come here a sec. Come here. Oh, that's so good. God bless you. Even if you don't feel it in your heart, you can go in the bathroom and puke when you're done. But... (laughs) But at least just bless them because there's something good that happens to us when we release what we think is ours and belongs to us and we surrender to the will of God. I'm going to show you about surrendering to the will of God and how good it is for your soul. He stole the hearts of the people. And and, and I wrote this down. Could you imagine? So the king's son is sitting outside the gate and everyone that's going to come to the president and to his team to get justice, to get, he would catch them before they could get there. He'd be like, friend. And you remember what the Bible says? The Bible says he had super long, pretty, beautiful hair. Ladies, he had no blemish on him. He was a handsome man. He was charismatic. He would have won American Idol for sure. And he would sit outside the gate and say, oh, friend, friend, come here, come here, come here. Are you going to see the king? Yeah, it's too bad the king is a bad king. And the Bible says that he would literally kiss them. Watch this. I I wrote this down. He used flattery to win people. False intimacy. Oh, I like you. You're so good to me. It's like a politician running for office. Yeah, here's the politician running for office. Put your hand out, and they do that cover thing. Yeah. Well, when I'm in charge, your life is going to be amazing. Absalom made promises that he could not keep. Because look what he told him. If I was in charge... Every person here would have justice. Every case would be settled. There would be no more racism. There would be no more welfare. There would be no more poor people. Everybody would have free education. Everything's going to be great because when I get in charge, I'm going to fix the world. Messiah complex, anybody? But we do it. We buy into it. These, These guys run for office. Oh, yeah, well, if only he was president. Right now, if he was president, we wouldn't be in this mess. Yes, we would. We've been in this mess since the, since the country was founded. There's always something. Why? Because man is not our savior. God is. Say it one more time. He's the source. He's the source. And we're looking around for all this stuff. And here's Absalom. He's like, oh, I'm going to fix everything. If I was the pastor, I've heard this, by the way. Boy, if I was in charge of that church, man, I would do that. I'd have it all. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Man, if we did this, we could fix everything. And I'm going, okay, all right. Churches split all the time over those kind of attitudes. Well, that guy, he's, he's, if I was in charge, I haven't seen something. And then they get in charge, and guess what they find out? Not easy. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Absalom took when he should have waited and trusted in the Lord, yeah? He provided for himself, and then he stole, literally stole the hearts of the people. Anybody here have a problem with stealing? 
All right, good. We got two honest people. <laughs> when I was seven years old, maybe eight, I think I've told you this story, our town had about a thousand people in it. We lived on a bunch of acres, and we would ride into town and go to this little tiny gas station, and there was this, uh, <laughs> my cousin goes in with me, and she's crazy. She's one of those girls, like, she's crazy. She'll get you in a fight. I mean, she's just crazy. And, and so we were in the grocery store, and I wasn't a thief. I, didn't, I wasn't ever stealing stuff. She, she goes over to the candy aisle, and she, she puts some candy in her pocket. So I saw one of those long pieces of bubble gum. Remember those guys when we were kids that wrapped in the paper? So I was like, well, okay. So I picked it up, and I shoved it down <laughs> my pants, and I tucked it over and put it into my belt. And it was all the way down to my ankle. And I literally left the store like this. Bless you, sir. Have a wonderful... Have a wonderful day. We went over and we pounded that candy, chewed all that gum, had a wonderful time. I felt so guilty and so bad. At 15 years old when I came to Jesus, really said, I want to serve you. I literally was driving through our old town and I said, hold on, pull over at this gas station for a second. We pulled over <laughs> and I took a quarter out of my, out of my car and I walked in and, and I said, yeah, hey, listen, um, when I was seven, I sold a piece of, um, I sold a piece of gum and I just wanted to, uh, I want, it was probably a nickel back then, maybe. And this is a quarter, so this, this makes up for all the, all the time that's passed. And I put the quarter down, and the dude looked at me like, you sold a piece of gum, and you're coming back nine years later, or whatever it is. And I said, yeah, man. He goes, you're a freak. <laughs> and I, I had the long hair then, too, so it really tripped him out. But when we steal... You know, what, you know what stealing is? Stealing is I don't trust you, God, to provide for me. That's all it is. Taking is I don't think God's good and he won't help me, so I'll help myself. And that's what Absalom did. He helped himself to something that was not his season or his time. Yeah? Let's look at David's response. I love King David's response to this moment. 2 Samuel 15, 30 says this. So, so now think about it. You're David. Be David. Forged in a wilderness, fighting bears and lions as a kid, rejected by your family, by your father. He starts worshiping God. He develops some crazy friendship with God. He becomes a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. He becomes king through a bunch of hardship, through a bunch of trials and tribulations. And there he is. His kingdom's ripping, and his son is creating a coup. And this is how he responds. 2 Samuel 15, 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered and, and went barefoot. And all the people were, who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went up. So pause. This is the man's response. I'm going to go up to the Mount of Olives. And you're going to see, I never saw this before. I never put this together. It's so good. And he's going to go up the Mount of Olives. And he's on the Mount of Olives. And he's, and he's weeping. And he's praying. And he's, I'm sure he's brokenhearted. Because this is his son. This is not just some stranger. If it was a stranger, he probably would have said, go and just nuke him. And he's weeping. And this is what he says. If you'll read the whole story tonight, read chapter 15. God, this is your kingdom. And if you want to take it from me, I surrender it to you. That's what he did. He surrendered it. Now let's look in, in, in Jesus. Let's compare Jesus and David. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. Coming out, he went to the Mount, where? Of Olives, where David surrendered his kingdom to the Father. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. David surrendered his kingdom in weeping on the Mount of Olives. Look right here. The very place where Jesus would literally give his life away for you. And he's like, Lord, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to be beat I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be totally rejected. And I don't want to do this. That's literally what he's saying. If there's another way, let's do it. And the father's like, there's no other way. And Jesus is like, then okay. Now watch this. Jesus is crucified. The devil thought he won. He's buried. Third day, God raises him from the dead. Now Jesus, listen, the whole kingdom is his, everything. When we surrender, what we, when we have moments where we feel like we're dying to something, 
oh my gosh, this is, this is horrific. This is the death of something. When we're surrendered before the Lord, it's not. It's actually seed getting put in the ground so it can come back to life. And we'll have a bigger harvest than if we go after it in our own strength like Absalom did. David surrendered his kingdom. Jesus surrendered his life. And the fruit that came from Jesus giving up his life is that I'm standing here today forgiven and loved by God, and you're sitting there forgiven and loved by God. Amen? So good. David was a prophetic picture of what Jesus would do when he went up on the Mount of Olives and said, I'm surrendering my life, this kingdom. Because here's the thing. David was a man after who? God's own heart. So this is what he basically did. For 33 years of David's 40-year reign as king, did you know for 33 years they had 24-7 prayer and worship in the tabernacle? For 33 years, guys, it would be like this room, and David paid musicians and singers, and he said, I want you just to, to love God. Why? Because that's what he developed in that, in that field. He knew he needed God to kill lions and bears and Goliath, and he knew he needed God to run the kingdom, and he said, I just want the presence of God, and David was a man after God's own heart. Listen to this. So when it came time, he thought he was losing his kingdom. Here's what he said, God, I want you anyways more than the kingdom. I just want to go hang out in the house of prayer and seek your face. I don't want to go to staff meetings. We'll let that young, dumb kid take this over and see what happens to him. Right? He was like, man, I just want to be with you. You can have the kingdom. When Samuel came to David and said, God's found a man who's after his heart to be king, David didn't focus on the king part. He didn't go, well, I'm going to be king? He said, I'm a man after God's own heart? God views me as a man after his own heart? Oh my gosh, this is amazing. He was a lover of God, so the stuff of this world did not matter. He was after God with everything that he had. You see the parallel? Satan, I will, I will, I will, I will. Do you know the theme song in, heaven, in hell is I did it my way? That's going to be their theme song. I did it my way. I'm going to kind of sing it for you. I will, I will, I will. I, I, I. Absalom. I, I, I. David, I surrender. I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. This is a much better way to live and surrender before the Lord. Yes? Amen? Amen. Come on. We often want the palace without the process. Amen? You ever see, I've heard employees like, I'll be at like Best Buy or something, and these employees, I hear them yapping about their manager. You ever been in there and like, yeah, that guy's a jerk. If I was the manager, I would bleep, bleep, bleep. And I'm like, if you were the manager, the place would go down the tubes. Because we always look and think, oh, I could do better. See, we want the promotion without the process. Ab Absalom wanted the kingdom. He wanted the promotion and didn't have the backstory of David's preparation. You see, it's the preparation time that was so important so that when he became king, he was a good king. All, all, all Absalom did was say, look at my dad. He's got the latest 19, well, AD 30, sweet donkey and camel. He's got a sweet house. Look at the house. Look at the ladies fanning him right now. Look, he says something and people go get what he wants. Well, he thinks he's amazing, doesn't he? But what he didn't see was when you pull the shirt up, all the scars on David's back from all the things that he had gone through. There's a friend of ours who, um, when I youth pastored up in Olympia, they had a giant, beautiful house on the Puget Sound. And he would have me watch the house, me and Cindy. He would say, would you guys come and watch our house? We're going to be X, Y, Z for the next eight days, and we just need you to come. And I'd be like, yeah. So I'd come to their house. It's amazing. All windows, Puget Sound, beautiful. And they're like, whoa, the fridge is full. It's got filet mignon. Like more food was in their fridge than we had had in our fridge since we'd been married. I mean, it was, just, it was massive. And he's like, you know what? Here's all the restaurants that I have accounts at. You guys are free to use that. And here's here, out, out in the garage, there's a couple Mercedes, and there's this, and you guys are free to drive those. I was like, this is going to be a good eight days. Then as they were leaving, she goes, now, honey, that's not enough. Give them some cash in case they need cash. He gives me 500 bucks. We're going to be there for six days. We made like $500 a month. This was like, what? You know, so we did not spend the cash. We left it in their desk. I was riding with a friend one time. We were going past their house. 
and they made a comment, ah, that, that guy goes to our church, yeah? And I go, yeah, and he goes, big old house. Who needs a house like that? Why doesn't he sell that house and give it to the poor? That's what he said, and I go, yeah, okay, Judas. <laughs> I said, well, what's your, what's your problem, dude? Can I tell you what your problem is real quick? You think his prosperity should be yours. You're jealous. You think that belongs to you. Did you go to dentistry school, whatever they call it, for eight years? Did you pay the price? He's 58 years old, 60 years old. He's worked very, very hard. By the way, that man gives more money away than he probably makes. I know the inside track of all the good things he does for the church, for people, for orphans. So you know what? You, you need to shut your trap. I mean, that's what I said. So we weren't friends after that. <clears throat> we, he, we, we no longer hung out, me and that guy, after that. But I was like, it's so funny that, that we always look at what everyone else has and think, well, I should have that. No, you shouldn't until the Lord says you should, right? Because if you got it, you know, I always say, if I won the lottery, man, I'd tithe to the church, Pastor Rick. I mean, what was it the other day? Like $700 million, some crazy thing. Oh, if I could only, Lord, let me win it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'll play the numbers, play the numbers. I'll give $70 million to the church. I'll tithe. No, you won't. You don't tithe now. You can't write a $100 check, let alone a $70 million check. You'd be writing it like this. Oh. Why? Because you're not prepared for that. You ever watch that show where people, people that lose it all after they win the lotto, you seen that? They're divorced, they're destroyed, they have no money. Why? Because they wanted the palace without the preparation. It's quick. Anything, anything quick and easy is not good. Have you ever noticed that? Brother, if you invest in us, you'll make a million dollars by next year. Hmm. All right, Bernie Madoff. <clears throat> I'm going to close with an idea about the prodigal son. The prodigal son was one who, by, by, by the way, oftentimes we see the assets of the kingdom without seeing, without seeing the adversaries of the kingdom. So we, we see the assets of that promotion or that guy that owns that company or that guy that's doing this, but we don't see the adversaries that they face because they're in that position. So we get there and go, this is neat. Every promotion has a downside and God made it that way to keep you humble. Yeah? He promotes you. You go, this is beautiful. Oh, I don't like this part of the job. It's just to keep you humble. He likes you. Real quick. I, just, I, I want you to catch this last point. We should be forged by humility instead of by pride. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud. When we are arrogant and proud, we're literally being resisted by God, who loves us, by the way. But when we are humble and humble ourselves and say, man, Lord, I ain't got it, his grace comes. Just today, I was walking before I came out here, I was in this little side room right here, and this is what I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm not good enough to do this. I got, you got you to gotta help me. Oh, man, I need your help, Jesus. And I've heard young guys have heard me pray that, and they go, dude, how many sermons have you preached in 36 years? I go, a lot. And they go, you got this? I had a, actually had a guy tell me one time, hey, pastor, we need you to preach last minute. And I go, oh, man, and I looked kind of terrified. And they said, you've preached thousands of sermons. You got this. And I said, bro, I ain't got this. Unless Jesus is here, unless his power, unless his grace is on my life, I don't have anything. I got nothing. So, so the desperate, hum, uh, uh, humble cry is what draws the Lord to us. Lord, I need you instead of, Lord, I got this. I went to the business seminar. I know what to do. And the Lord's like, I want to do something different. And, he, and you're so busy watching the stock market that you're not, you're not watching the kingdom and seeing what he wants you to do. Amen? Not a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> the prodigal son syndrome is what Absalom really walked in. And I'm going to show it to you. Luke 15, 11. Jesus is giving the parable of the prodigal son. He says, this he said, a certain man had two sons. 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to his, li- his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. He went to Las Vegas, to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions on prodigal living. Everybody say wasted. Absalom's legacy was wasted on a temporal goal. His whole entire legacy was wasted on just trying to get to that place instead of letting God forge him to be in the place where God wanted him to be. The the prodigal son said, give it to me, it's mine. And then he went out and the Bible says, and he wasted it. Now, if Absalom had responded like the prodigal son, it would have been a different story. Let's look at that real quick. By the way, it's amazing. Absalom dishonored his dad, the king, and God's anointed because he was not perfect. Because David was not a perfect leader, Absalom went after him. Do you know any Absaloms in your life that are super critical of everybody else, but they don't turn the flashlight on themselves, right? Judge, 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 criticize, criticize, judge, 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 ooh, look at that, ooh, what are they doing? And they don't do this. It's in my heart. Why am I feeling this way? And the Lord will show you if you'll ask him. So watch what happens. Here's the prodigal son. He's wasted everything. He rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring out the best clothes, the best ring, the best shoes. Restore him, for my son was lost, and now he is found. Watch this. That is the father's heart in heaven who created you. He is not asking you to get down and do penance. He's not asking you to crawl on glass to come to him because of all the sins you've committed. If if Absalom would have just went to David and said, hey, dad, can I talk to you for a sec? I blew it. I was arrogant. I was mad at you. And I really need you to forgive me because I want to be all all that the the Lord has called me to be. Man, David would have forgave him in two seconds. Because when they went out to do battle, by the way, I'm going to give you a verse to read tonight. In 2 Samuel 18, just read the whole thing because this is where they go after Absalom. And David says, don't hurt my son. And here's what happens. Absalom's running from the armies on a donkey. By the way, if you're going to run from an army, choose a different vehicle right? Oh, the army's here. There's a big white stallion. You're like, no, I choose the donkey, you know, and the donkey's like, oh, oh," you know, he's barely going, come on, man, and the donkey's like, whatever the noise they make. It's a billy goat, I think. His long, beautiful hair, the Bible talked about just a couple chapters ago, how amazing it was, how strong it was. As he goes underneath an oak tree, his hair gets wrapped in a limb and yanks him off his donkey, and he's hanging in midair. And the men of David find him hanging there, vulnerable. See, pride will make you vulnerable. Pride will make you vulnerable to the arrows of the enemy. And there, Joab, didn't heed to David's voice, took spears and ran them through Absalom's heart. Then they took him down and they threw him in a pit and threw rocks on top of him. And David wept, the Bible says. Pride will hang you. Self-seeking will hang you. When you try to do it your way, when you try to make your life like the old Burger King song, have it your way, have it your way, it will hang you. The very charisma that Absalom possessed is the very thing that killed him. It took him down. See, Absalom chose to war instead of wait. Absalom chose to war against, watch this, the will of God, and you never win warring against the word of God and his will, ever. You lose every single time, even if you think you're winning momentarily, you lose. God's plan for you is great, awesome. He wants to give you that spouse. He wants to give you that job. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. He wants to do it. But man, he's in a process with you as you work your way towards his promotion. So don't short circuit the process of getting to the promotion. Amen. Surrender to his will. Let's pray.